uh, I'm Mars. Uh, I work as a freelance uh, software developer currently in Udna Care with uh, a couple of guys here. Uh, I've been coding since I was a small kid, uh, whatever, I mean, anything, hacking, whatever. And uh, uh, yeah, let's just go to uh, this. Um, there are many reasons for connecting any kind of hardware to the PC. Uh, there's uh, the makerspace, and you have human interaction devices, uh, and also all these the most excellent technology things. But uh, <clears throat> what I've been uh, looking at uh, in recent times is uh, why would there be an incentive for the traditional hardware industry to look into how can you connect? I mean, what, what is the reason why they connect hardware that is otherwise working fine to PC software? And uh, there are of course some obvious reasons that uh, if we take, for example, this, uh, just a few generations apart, uh, you have the uh, the uh, uh, this electronic saxophone from uh, Akai that used to ship with uh, a very fine and expensive uh, box you had to carry with you, rack mount, uh, with a small LCD display that just doesn't cut it anymore. So that's one reason to, uh, of course, with the complexity and the uh, user expectations moving to PC software connecting is faster to change, it's easier to do last minute uh, uh, updates and so forth. There's also the other thing about uh, human uh, device interaction, uh, human uh, machine interaction, it's so much more difficult to change knobs and dials on a customized piece of hardware than it is to just adjust to something that is off the shelf, like uh, now we even have touch screens and desktops. Um, so, of course, many of these traditional hardware companies say, let's just, uh, let's just make some software that connects with the uh, well, hardware. Build processes must be fine because it's proven to work. Everything's good sometimes, right? Um, so, uh, what, uh, what often happens is that uh, a native uh, Windows solution is made for uh, for a particular piece of hardware, or to replace a particular piece of hardware, or to update it somehow, to gain this uh, extra functionality. But uh, in the traditional hardware companies, very often this is not catered for as a traditional software company would do it, because of many reasons, management and hierarchy and whatnot. So, um, this is something that I've seen a few times that uh, that like a quick native solution is done for the first customer and uh, maybe only one guy, the guy who used to work with the hardware, and he did it. But then uh, then it becomes more interesting and we increase maintenance costs because now we need to find out okay, how do we update this, how do we get it out there. Then more customers come on, more developers, the salespeople of course are interested in selling this stuff, so they're pushing from their side and management still doesn't get that software is different from hardware. So uh, at some point we end up with a snowball that uh, requires that guy for any fix. Uh, it's good for that guy, but it's never going to get fired. But you will end up often in something that's very difficult to migrate to other operating systems. Expensive, and uh, depending on how you chose your solution, uh, tied in with uh, uh, non-maintained uh, libraries or whatever. I, I know that there's a lot of people from the web crowd here, so. This is very far from what you're used to, but uh, I tell you, it uh, happens. So, what do we want? We want something that is uh, fairly low maintenance cost and uh, easy to get out there uh, fast. We want it uh, small componentized, easily testable, uh, in a way where you can uh, uh, like get more developers on the team fast if you want to scale up without destroying uh, the, um, the core of the software. So that's why it's important that it's componentized and piece accessible. You also don't want to get into this hell of uh, being responsible for the whole updating and deployment for all your uh, customers, especially if, I mean, if, you, if, you're, if you're in a company that sells a few big solutions, it doesn't matter that much. But if you sell maybe 10,000 installations or more, it becomes extremely expensive to have agents to go out to all these places to maintain every time something doesn't work. And um, 
Og Linux, der er sat fairly okay, og der er different flavors of Linux, der er different updating mechanisms that seem to work. Windows is getting there with the marketplace, but still you have to train people internally to understand how do you actually utilize each ecosystem on each uh, OS. And people use different OS and in different variants of the different OSs. Um, and you also want to be able to have an easy migration to another system. If that moves, if all of a sudden uh, uh, PC is not the thing, but Android tablets is, you don't want to be stuck on PC. You want to have something that can move. Um, so there's been some solutions for 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 a few years. I know that uh, Kenneth here, for some and tools <laughs> have been working uh, with Qt. And uh, myself included. These are these are all the solutions that can deliver um, somewhat uh, good cross-platform solutions to different in, in each of their own field. You know Java, Axe. I don't know if you know that, but it's uh, like a Flash uh, in family with Flash. <laughs> and uh, WX, which is cute, is uh, cute. I think is used now in. Uh, in the, the airline industry and car, uh, car dashboards and stuff like this, also a lot of embedded things. The good thing about Qt is that it's a C++ uh, framework mainly, but they also have this um, QML descriptive language on top that makes it extremely fast in prototyping and, and, uh, and uh, very, very fast in space. <laughs> the, I remember Nokia when we were there and they did it. Uh, the target was a uh, mobile phone, QML had to be able to run 60 frames a second minimum. So that's why they removed a lot of complex drawing routines. Whatever. So what is in there now is actually pretty fast. Uh, you, you can't go all wrong by using it. I don't know, what do you say, tools? No, yes. <laughs> you know I mean? However, uh, there's still the problem with uh, deployment and upgrades. Because even though that you can develop something that works multi-platform, uh, each of these different solutions still have the issue of how to get the last mile and how, how do I actually deliver this on the Windows or the Mac or the whatever platform. And you see this is uh, slightly more expensive than larger. But it can go bad. Easy if you do they even run? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I have a claim here and that is that uh, that, uh, that the, the web is actually ready for the enterprise. There are many different components in this. Um, we have the hardware connectivity, we have uh, fast graphics, we have uh, something called progressive web apps, which uh, allows you to do a hosted web app that can be installed when the user interacts with the application. There's a lot of frameworks and web components. Digging in a little bit here, uh, many claim that you can't do high performance with the web, but and that may have been true some years ago, but uh, a lot has moved uh, since then. So WebGL ties directly to the GPU, Web Audio, uh, similar to the audio processing. And there's a lot of stuff going on there now where you can do uh, like Doppler effects in real time and, and processing <coughs> of sounds, uh, robot uh, voice, uh, backfeed uh, immediately and all this, even on mobile phones. Uh, but there's also two things that is more behind the scenes, but very important. There's WebAssembly, which allows you to do uh, native uh, code that uh, gets compiled to something that is uh, how much is it? like a 1.5 ish from a, a pure native C code, isn't it? Something like this. I think like they even like say like it's 1.2 times the speed of native code, but yeah. you want to get better. Yeah. And, and it's very small, so like the loading time, like actually to download the code, is, is, doesn't take that long. Yeah. Doesn't take that long, and and it's just going to get better. So it's kind of like a binary assembly kind of language. So it's kind of, it's basically like stack based, but it's it's it does kind of the idea. Yeah. So they're looking at like like progressive loading. So if you have have a game, you load it, like but you need to show the first scene, and then you start playing, then maybe you load the sound mm -hmm. in, and then you load like the other. Game. And all this cash yeah. yeah, but, but in practical terms, uh, to those of you who haven't tried it, uh, uh, the hello world with WebAssembly is basically you do a small piece of uh, C code uh, that is similar to, I guess, a Python plugin issue used to be. 
and then you compile it with this the client compiler and, and there's some other tools in scripting. Well, okay. tooling isn't really done yet, so people are working on that. But even today, like like Microsoft, like the, the team that they, they call like the, the Xamarin people, yeah. who worked on like Mono and this C sharp and F sharp compiler, they just showed that they had like C sharp and F sharp running on WebAssembly on the web, on the new browser. Yeah. So, is it the same with the VS Code uh, thing? Or? I uh, I don't think so, not yet, oh, but like. At least it shows that even like Microsoft will be able to like, like take your legacy code that running in C sharp and, and put it on the web. Yeah, but, but anyway, it's uh, it's pretty fast. And uh, a new cool feature of uh, this uh, web workers which allows you to utilize from pure JavaScript utilize a multi core processor. Of course, the web people know this, uh, uh, but uh, you can use this uh, shared array buffer now, which means that uh, uh, you can you don't have to transfer the Data between the, the, the units anymore that you used to be, have to like uh, do the even in six in the beginning. Right? <laughs> uh, but then you need to deal with locking. Uh, yeah, just like using threads. But anyway, this is not directly other related, but it's really not. <laughs> Any questions on anything? Yet? I guess we want to know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Will, we, will you cover the security concerns? Uh, security concerns? Yeah. Ah, uh, like uh, oh. native native code running in browser. Uh, that would be your guy. Uh, <laughs> well, just like showing the whole web assembly, like it's running in the same sandbox of anything on the web. Uh, so you don't awesome. like have like access to like hardware features. Mm -hmm. uh, everything that you have access to, or like this, this regular thing in the web browser, will have to go through the web browser. Mm -hmm. So it's like DOM APIs. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at optimizing that. Currently, talk, it talks to JavaScript. Mm -hmm. We should do the, the call through the browser to like C++ and through back through JavaScript and to WebAssembly mm -hmm. and that would be shortcut so it would go like directly into like C++ like Chrome mm -hmm. and Edge where it's in C++ um, So you don't have like extra capabilities What they do though, if you try with WebAssembly there's something called Enscripted which is kind of like a compiler um, which tries to allow you to compile you can say a, a Unity game or what, what not or like a and we'll game and put it in the browser. And they'll kind of create like something like an applet, if you don't remember Java, yeah. where they'll half implement some parts you remember Java. Java. <laughs> 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 they'll implement some, some <laughs> things in, <laughs> they'll implement some things in, in, in JavaScript. So that's like the, the, the web GL, uh, the web audio for audio. So in, it's actually the other way around. They will let you run a Java, like a JavaScript app in the browser, which will call out to WebAssembly to run the logic. So like all the calls for the graphics will run through WebGL, all your audio will run through Web Audio. So it's kind of like from the JavaScript side it will call into WebAssembly. And then we do things like the similar we did like test with, with the uh, not Unity but the Unreal engine. Yeah, and it's awesome. running like 1.20, like so 20 percent slower uh, mm -hmm. than like native code. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. But uh, another thing is uh, web components that I've been uh, pretty fond of the uh, last couple of uh, years now. Uh, that, that makes it possible for, for uh, teams to, to componentize, really componentize all your code. And I know that uh, a few people sitting here that uh, moved from was it ActiveX Flash to Polymer in this case, but uh, web components in general. And uh, I think uh, that job was done pretty well, moving uh, like from native code to web, and they actually seemed to, to, to work because it's not no longer the big snowball of code where you have to plug in uh, everything in the framework. You can do it in small components, even McDonald's like it. As you see, YouTube uh, is based on that now. There's a lot of public components you can just download and get stuff done quickly. And uh, as you can see there, most uh, browsers are either Currently uh, supported uh, directly or have polyfills that uh, makes it work for you. Good guys, know that. So, so probably explain what's a polyfill. A polyfill. Okay. Does anyone not know what the polyfill is? Fine. Okay. Um, the web is so dynamic with JavaScript that uh, you can make it like big things that uh, where it's a prototyping language, right? Is that the right way of saying it? Or is it that you, you can build it I would put it the way that a polyfill is when you have a feature which has been like standardized, so it's supposed to be in all the new browsers, but you might not be running the latest and greatest browser. 
So you implement that uh, feature using the control you already have on the web. So it might not give the exact same performance characteristics, but you get like the same uh, the same experience. So it, it it might mean that using a polyfill you have to load a few more bytes or kilobytes, so it becomes a bit slower in loading time, and the feature might also run a bit slower. But it allows you to target like more users. The support library for new features. Basically, the basically, yeah. yeah. The old browser. Yeah. Sorry. And, and just before we end, like there's also if you've ever heard there's something called a polyfill, and so. Just if you look on the web, what the hell is the polyfill? And that's kind of when they look at something that they expect to be a new feature and they try to implement it so people can play with it to figure out if the APIs are nice. And that, that's kind of what they did with Polymer uh, yeah. project in the beginning, where 0.5, everything yeah. here was uh, polyfill. And then when they stabilized it and found out uh, they agreed with uh, different browser windows that this is a way to go with uh, web components, then they stabilized it and got it into. The, the native code, so that it actually, if you're using Chrome and uh, I guess Safari, Firefox on the right uh, areas, Zoom, Edge, then it doesn't need to load all this framework. I think uh, the Chrome uh, Polymer 2 with uh, Chrome, they got down to 11, uh, 11 kilobytes for the whole thing framework that you need to get. You know. That's uh, web components. And the last thing here uh, in this family is uh, something called uh, web progressive web. Applications. It's sort of a marketing name for an uh, uh, umbrella of, of uh, things that need to be in place for you to get a native-like experience uh, using, uh, you get, if you go to Financial Times or Airbnb, or very important, this was the first one, Air Corner, which is a very annoying Google Silla style app, <laughs> you, uh, you, you get uh, presented with an install button after a few times or after you have some interaction with it. And then it actually gets installed either to your now uh, Windows PC soon, right? or uh, mobile phone as a native app. It has a native experience. So this is something that even Microsoft they're pushing hard. And this, these uh, boxes here, the gray ones, are directly stolen from uh, this guy's uh, Microsoft uh, slides, uh, showing that uh, they are moving in that direction and it's very important for them. So they, they integrated, I think with the creators update, they integrated. Uh, what they scrape off the web of progressive web apps into their uh, into their store. So if you go to the Windows Store in your machine, some of those apps could be like anything posted somewhere, and you don't know that it's like that. It just feels like I was actually told that I think it was nine out of the top ten apps are web apps. Yeah, people don't know. And even like Netflix is a web app on yeah. Windows, yeah. and no one knows. So so that that's why. Uh, it, it, it actually works. <laughs> are, are those loaded in uh, like Chromium as an engine? When, when, it, it when it's in Microsoft Store, I guess it's an edge. It's an edge. But, uh, so, so the thing with, with progressive web apps is that you have something called a service worker, which you have to implement so it has to work like offline. And then you have like a web app manifest, where you define like, how your app should interact, like uh, what kind of icons should it use, uh, what is the description, like all the things you need for the store. But I was like, when you load the app, this should not show like an address bar on the top and a forward bar and a back button and all of that. So you really get like this native experience. Uh, and, and even like, if you go to, if you're on an Android phone, you go to m.uber or uber.com, it actually loads the, the Uber app. It looks exactly like the native app and it works great. Yeah, there's a small, and then there's a small comparison that the, the Sudan Ola is uh, the caps in uh, India. It's in both. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they just showed the comparison here. The Android app, native app, is 23 megabytes. The iOS app is 100. Oh, this is Twitter. Uh, Twitter, sorry, Twitter. Uh, 23 megabytes. iOS is 100 megabytes, and the progressive web app is, is 0 0.6. So uh, you can see in areas with uh, expensive data, and uh, and you want uh, things done fast, then uh, I know what I would choose. Uh, well, if I'm a, an operator. Uh, charging by the device. Uh, <laughs> 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 it all depends on your priorities. Right? So, oh, okay, oops, let's see if I. Oh. This was my most excellent slide. Let's get back on the topic of that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, so let's look a little bit at the uh, USB. And uh, this might get a little bit hairy, so please just stop me and ask questions for. Anything. Uh, I guess most of you know what USB is, at least from a user perspective, but uh, what happens uh, on a very high level is that uh, 
uh, when you plug in some USB hardware, uh, or you create some USB hardware that, that has the USB logo on it, and you, and you are part of this uh, uh, USB organization, you paid a lot of dollars for that, and uh, you get a vendor ID, which is a 16-bit uh, integer, uh, and you can, under that, create a lot of products, another 65,000 products, that can be other than, and that's sort of the unique identification on a high level. Um, it is uh, on Windows. You probably also know uh, those of you, of you who still use that. Uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> that uh, you usually have this driver file that you need to run. It has an inf uh, uh, extension and uh, and uh, it has to be signed in the after Windows. 8.1 by default if it's not signed uh, even if you're using Microsoft's own binaries to drive your hardware you still need an inf file with your vendor and product ID put in signed and paid by Microsoft every year that's a certificate for that uh, yeah and uh, they have to fill out some forms or whatever uh, there are very strict rules because they, they, they are not stupid, right? They want their money. I think that must be why. Because it's illegal for, and uh, now it is illegal for uh, vendors who do this to resell groups of product IDs under their, under their vendor ID. So, for example, how many produce 65,000 devices, right? So you say, okay, let's, let's uh, grab the first thousand for us and we'll sell the rest and we'll make, uh, <laughs> we'll make some money in that. That's illegal. Uh, so um, you'll lose your license. Uh, however, it is possible for companies like uh, NXP, uh, uh, I guess also Nordic and others, to say, okay, this is a partner who's going to use our, our hardware. Uh, let's give him a product ID, and they can produce up to 10,000 units. Uh, if it's more than that, it's considered big production, and then you leave your own. Um, however, there is a small uh, open source a GitHub project that uh, that is tied to a specific vendor ID where you can, if you have uh, open source hardware, open source open, uh, open source software, and then you can uh, request uh, product ID from their collection because they have a vendor ID that was registered before you speed at all put these rules into place. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I can, I can. Uh, you can ask me later if you're interested in this. So, uh, you probably know when you plug in a keyboard, it just works like this, a mass storage device as well. Uh, until recently, with Windows at least, you needed a driver for a serial device or other things. That's been fixed in Windows 10. Uh, but uh, but that's, uh, that's related to different categories of USB hardware. That's on the next level, that's something that goes on when you do a um, handshake with the device, but uh, <clears throat> then again you have this uh, with Windows still that uh, you need to sign and you need to buy uh, the uh, the, uh, the certificates so you can sign the inf files from Microsoft. Uh, so it is only sometimes it's a plug and play that it was supposed to do. Uh, Many of the industry's hardware solutions using USB uh, use uh, serial communication uh, and many of those again buy a standard chip from uh, either was it, uh, STM or FTDI or so, whatever and uh, that's, uh, oh sorry, and that's, uh, um, that works well, now also in Windows 10, so that you could that something be used. Let me see how the Windows chart is up. Well, yeah. Um, on the next level, below these uh, classifications, you have uh, some device configurations. Let's just jump to the picture. It's easy to see. You have a device descriptor with a configuration, and you can have multiple interfaces defined on uh, on one USB device, so that you can have a multi-purpose device. In Windows, it comes up as a composite device. And that's also something that we are going to use here for for uh, web USB in a second. Uh, USB serial is defined in this way, where you have uh, old school uh, uh, 
uh, an interrupt uh, uh, interface where you can set bow rate and uh, parity or not, and then you have the input output uh, endpoints. Uh, let's see how. But if you want to communicate directly with the browser using a uh, standard FTDI STM chip with uh, USB CDC or serial. Then either you have to use this Chrome serial, which is now deprecated, uh, but only works in Chrome OS, and of course on Chrome. Open that web serial and will arrive, uh, right, which is really not uh, most probably. Uh, or you can create some native uh, code uh, either with web sockets, which doesn't work if you have production uh, code out there, and that is because does anyone know want to know why it doesn't work? You know why? <laughs> Something about uh, actually, I guess it's because of the stupid banking system. No, it's, it's because if you have uh, an HTTPS-based uh, uh, website you uh, you go to, then you cannot make AJAX calls to a non-HTTPS uh, endpoint somewhere else. And it has to be not self-signed, it has to be like uh, uh, officially approved. And you're never going to get an official certificate for localhost. So uh, that's not going to work. Uh, native messaging is another way, uh, it's part of uh, web extensions. And um, so it's, uh, it's nice to bring a mannequin that's going to show that later how that works. Uh, and that's something that uh, seems to be, uh, be staying because it's in Chrome, Firefox, it has it now. Um, Apple has their own custom solution for it, but it's possible. Are there any uh, questions? Uh, Maybe you should explain how native messaging works. Yeah, I'm going get to get to that. Um, hopefully, uh, we're going to get to that later. Sorry. Yeah, nice. So uh, there's something that uh, came from Google, uh, I think uh, they promoted it uh, mid uh, last year and it got uh, working pretty well for Linux, Windows, Mac uh, in the beginning of the year and uh, in uh, Chrome M61 which is uh, <coughs> released in the end of September, that's the stable version there, it's going to be part of stable Chrome and it's going to stay for at least a couple of years. Uh, and then they will see how the industry picks it up or not. Um, yeah, so, so, so the thing is that Google they decided that doing like Chrome OS APIs, like proprietary APIs, was not the future. Uh, so they decided that they're going like all open web and deprecating all their special Chrome APIs. So that's kind of why the guy that actually did the, the Chrome.usb API had to come up with the right solution that actually works on the open web. So that's with all the security implications. Uh, and he came up with this API. So I'm pretty sure it's going to stay around, but the way that Google they always say with new features is that if no one ever uses this feature, they will consider it for removal after two years. But you already see a lot of people looking at USB and really like the new API. Yeah. So um, the benefit of, of uh, web USB is that uh, it actually doesn't require any, uh, any drivers on the on the PC side, it does require uh, a few changes on the on the firmware side, um, and it's available now behind a flag, so you can even try it out. But they don't really—that's the change they make, right? You don't really need to make any changes to the firmware side. You still need the web USB. Uh, yes, you need the web USB endpoints and uh, the the binary descriptor to say that this is web USB. Isn't that what it just changed, right? No, now? no, they removed the they removed the, the requirement for origin. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So before the security was even more secure, so it required that you in the hardware knew exactly which websites would access this hardware, and they removed the, the which is nice because uh, OEMs would have a hard time, I think, uh, knowing upfront what to, to support. But it's, it's basically extending what you put into the uh, configuration description. You make another interface, which is a web USB interface that you can access. And especially for the um, uh, traditional hardware industry, they want to support both legacy solutions and web USB. You can make a composite uh, uh, descriptor in, uh, in your USB firmware. So for old PCs or old solutions uh, without the latest Chrome, 
you can still use your standard uh, web serial, oh, no, sorry, uh, USB serial driver, and it will just work on that. And in your uh, serial conf uh, Chrome setup, and for the future, you can use the web USB interface. And uh, of course, you have to do some uh, some uh, slightly bright code on the firmware side to select which one to speak with. But I know that tool you just managed to do that on the mannequin down there, so I'm pretty sure it's uh, possible. Also, yeah. Logitech. Also, Logitech. Yeah, I mean, this small company, I don't, I don't know if you've heard of the Logitech. They seem, I think, apparently they're interested in this as well. So uh, mm -hmm. imagine um, how much money a company like Logitech can save on not having to do native drivers, shipping that and support and maintenance, whatever, all these things. But it's not just about like the native drivers, because sometimes you have like standardized USB drivers like keyboard, uh, but maybe you want to configure the keyboard because like special keys. So instead of having like to create like a special like software stack you need to install, uh, then you can just like plug it in and just like web browser. And they can update the app like online, so you don't need to download this new driver, you just like open it and it has new features. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm pretty excited about this, at least uh, I think it's uh, going to be pretty big. There are some things on Windows still, <coughs> of course. Um, if you make it from the USB specs where you're supposed to, it works on Linux and Mac out of the box. It took me two meetings to get it done. I thought, okay, Microsoft, it can't take more than a week. It took half a year. <laughs> not, not, not full time. <laughs> but uh, there's been a lot of discussions on, like, okay, what do we need, how to get this working, whatever. But it seems to work now. The thing is, uh, for Windows not to require these signed uh, in files with uh, just a link to their own binary, you need to put in some binary chunks that will be sent back and forth when you negotiate with the USB device that Linux and Mac don't care about. But Windows needs sort of the same amount that you spend on just getting it working, you need maybe one and a half times as much for Windows. But then it actually also works in the end. I was happy. There's this little thing that uh, you have to use version 2 of the of these descriptors if you're using Windows 8.1 and after, or version 1 for 8.0 and below. But, uh, Small sacrifice. Uh, there's also a requirement for web USB on Windows to have a special device interface the uh, section, but that's only until the new USB backend is in place in Chrome and uh, shown by. Uh, also, when you plug in hardware into the browser, normally it comes up with a pop up saying uh, if you have landing, you can put in a landing page into the USB firmware. It will pop up on Linux and Mac, and Windows is going to come in the final release. And this uh, device uh, interface uh, grid that was required, uh, like it just a grid that you come up with yourself, or it didn't work. There was actually a tool here who did that. Uh, yeah, he's very good. <laughs> he, he actually looked into this. Well, did you look into the source code of uh, LibUSB? Uh, yeah. And you found it. This is why. <laughs> So nobody knew why. Like, okay, sometimes you need, sometimes you don't. For composite units, you have to have this in. For non-composite, you can sort of leave it out. But for now, put it in, so it works. Uh, let's see. This is not that super interesting. I can uh, send you some code later for those who are interested. The firmware side. This is where you sort of define your extra. Uh, this is the web USB parts with a with a unique identifier and stuff in the firmware here. The Windows specific parts the interface parts, and then on JavaScript side, how you connect to it. So basically, on, um, with WebUSB, it's, it's very simple to use uh, when, it's, when it's up and running. You, uh, you, uh, uh, sorry, what a word, what am I doing here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, request a, you request a device and you request the interfaces and uh, the, uh, uh, that you know that you've defined on the other side. And uh, if there's user rights to access the device, then you should, and there's nobody else to claim it, then you should actually have a, an open connection to your USB device. Uh, up and running. And, <coughs> oops, let's try it. Let's see if it works. Uh, I have something here. No magic. Uh, let's uh, try to plug it in. Let's see. Uh, oh, it's oh. 
the notification. There, there it is. Notification. Dark. Thanks. I should close all the Twitter. <laughs> okay, so um, it jumped directly to the web page that's supported by the, that is written in the landing page of the firmware here. It uh, because I already used it in the web page, it doesn't need to scan, but I can scan for for the hardware. It says okay, this one fine. Connect. You get some hardware info. Then I can start sending data. Okay, and this works all without any drivers or anything. Just plug it into a browser. Just imagine with all the all driver disks and all this. So, um, quick question. Yeah. Uh, so the actual uh, website or uh, yeah. whatever it should open is that encoded for the device? Yeah, you put it in as a landing page. Of course, you can yeah. do your firmware more or less intelligent. You can do it so that it's have something configurable that will happen when you, uh, if, if you're an OEM and you want the landing page to be there, then you can um, make something that your that your customer can reconfigure so that that landing page will be hit it work. So you could also make another website in the future and use that to access. Uh, so, so basically you write the driver as part of the website. Okay. So you yeah. can even write like a library, yeah. like, like you get like a raw data, then you interpret it, you can do, the, you can do that as part of the website, you can make a library. And, and you don't need to do a landing page. I know that uh, uh, Tosi decided not, yeah, you didn't, uh, decide not to put a landing page on the mannequin. Okay. And then you could basically use whatever HTTPS, uh, I think it's HTTPS is required. Yes. Uh, and there are some other things, if you use an iframe, you need to, you need to use this feature, policy, uh, security model and, and other things. But, but it's, it's coming along. Um, and that, uh, what are you saying about the iframe is that it's not like if you embed an iframe, you can suddenly like access all your USB devices. Unless the web page will like white uh, list that specific where web page is like as able to access a USB device. So this is not going to work for keyboards yet. Well, uh, no, uh, yes and no, because the keyboard. Uh, would have a standard human uh, uh, device interface, API interface uh, as one of them, and then another one with web USB. So you plug it in, the system takes the, the one that uh, speaks keyboard, but the browser can pick up the web USB part for configuration from Logitech, for example. So that's how it's going to work. The, the, different ver the different interfaces on the same device. Uh, uh, you can claim them uh, in, in different of, of each other. They're not. They don't have to follow each other. It means that USB has some predefined devices like mice, keyboard. Yeah. So like they're already the system will support them. So it's not like you can only use the keyboard on this web page. It will just work with the system. So if you want to do something else with the keyboard, like configure it or change the lightings below the keys, then you can write like a web USB descriptor for that and then make a web page. Where you can actually change these things. Yeah. But you cannot act as a keyboard because that's already defined as a specific thing. Yeah. It's the same things that you would do with the driver CD coming with the keyboard or the mouse or the joystick or whatever, right? So, I, yeah. I, I saw it when you open it just the page right now. You open it in the HTTPS uh, URL. Yeah. That's in your server somewhere. I should, uh, I, I wish it's GitHub, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. it's uh, in GitHub. Yeah. And then, what did you get? I mean, uh, uh, in theory, when you plug the USB uh, key or okay. keyboard or something, there is this shape of I am the USB device. And then uh, I can imagine that that um, the web browser becomes the client, and uh, the USB key is the server as well. It asks for information. Is a URL, for example, and then the browser redirect to that. Yeah, well, what that, I think that, that uh, how it works is that your, your computer or your phone would be like the host, yes. and the device is called peripheral. Yes. So it is kind of a master slave thing. Yeah. Uh, and you're always only with this API. You are always like connecting to peripheral. Yeah. It's not the other way around. You cannot. You cannot like become a host. Yeah, but you are host. It's the peripheral that is the, the server, the host. Uh, no. This is the yeah, so device. Well, well, it's, this is a client device. It only has a, 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 a device has a little bit of extra information saying that this is uh, the preferred landing page. Uh, this is the landing page, but I don't have to put it in. I guess what, what Logitech is going to do uh, may not contain uh, the landing page, but uh, have some sort of other way of directing the customer to uh, a website that can configure their 
this stuff because of course also you're not interested in every time you uh, plug in that uh, it always pops up with this. There's, there's going to be some strategies for this, I'm sure. Okay. Well, but if it's a keyboard, you're not going to unplug and unplug it a lot, so it might not matter. Ah, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Any, anyhow, uh, uh, I mean, you're, you're free to ask me uh, detailed questions afterwards, but uh, is there any, anything that needs clarification? On, uh, I have a question, uh, a little bit of the same problem okay. as before, actually. I mean, what if you have two or three devices, each with their you know, driver and landing page, and you want to have them you know, working together in some kind of application? How does that work? Mm -hmm. uh, like you would have uh, five keyboards connected. No, I mean, you, you get to the landing page, you get to get the driver for the device. Uh, that's not how it uh, works. Uh, the the um, um, okay. When you plug in a device with you a USB a web USB descriptor, mm -hmm. currently only Chrome, but soon hopefully others. Uh, and then they have to fight for it. <laughs> They're gonna find out how. It will pick it up and say this has web USB functionality. It then goes and requests things like the landing page if it's present. That's all it does. Then it shows a notification. You can click that notification. It goes to the web page that was written in the notification. That web page contains JavaScript code that hopefully, that uh, opens or tries to open a device with uh, the matching vendor product ID. Uh, if you do it nicely, the filtering, and then you pair, you you get a user notification that you cannot uh, bypass. It's part of the security that the user will be the first time on the same web page. It will have to ask if it can pair with that. You click it, say thank you. After that, the uh, the, the piece of code you saw in JavaScript before will pick it up, get access, and from there on, everything happens in JavaScript. You do everything. But it's not that uh, tricky with uh, it's a very simple input output uh, endpoints. So you basically just get a stream in, stream out. And you can do whatever you want. Yeah, it, it's kind of a protocol for communication. So you can decide, like, on, say, like it's a device like showing like temperature and humidity. You might be able to do logic on the device itself and just like give the end result. Or you might give like raw data and depending on the driver or website or JavaScript, mm -hmm. running on the clients are doing the same. Like you decide where you have the logic. It's just a protocol. Mm -hmm. So the thing he was saying about like how, how do you interact with it in multiple devices. So generally with this API, if you just do a USB, any website can access any of these devices, but they'll have to show a prompt. They'll have to show like, hey, I'm trying to connect to this device and, and do some filtering so it doesn't like show all your devices, but only like a webcam, for instance. And then you decide to connect to it. And then you've given it like access to your device. And you can do that for multiple devices. Yeah, that, that page behind HTTPS has access to that device. Yes. Could I mean, could I mean work offline after after the first visit to that to those pages? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's, that's, that's the, the thing. Way. If you combine from this progressive web apps uh, with progressive web apps, the application itself thinks it's online even when it's online. If it's done right, right? So, and, and that if you combine all these things, that's why I also sort of quickly mentioned the other things because combining those things, you will have something that uh, downloads fast. Seems like a native app for the user can integrate hardware and uh, you know, easy. So, so that's why. And there's one final thing is that you, you can also make a device and by adding some of these like descriptors, you can, you can fix it to only work on a specific website. So say like NovQ, they only wanted the device to work with their web app. They didn't want anyone else to use it. They could actually hard code the website. But does that work anymore? I think that, that's supposed to still work, but it's optional. Yeah, optional. Okay, ah, it's optional. Okay. Yeah. It is on, on time. Yeah. Okay. So, but uh, there's a few more uh, interesting things there. Of course, uh, some people will say, ah, but you can also connect other USB like devices. So we experimented a bit, uh, actually, when doing some drivers for, for these mannequins here. Uh, looked at uh, what about exotic things like WebB. It's uh, currently in uh, Chrome and uh, and uh, therefore, in, in uh, Opera, because they use the same uh, <laughs> they use Blink, of course. Uh, but it's a, it is plug and play without extra drivers, and um, it is not intended for ordinary data transfer, but uh, this is a slightly crazy guy, very nice. It's intended for the <laughs> main keyboards. Yeah, uh, Louis Montes, who uh, who's doing a lot of. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> who's doing a lot of. Uh, uh, for uh, 
different countries as well, right? Uh, the hardware and software, where we decided that uh, this could be used for communicating with those things. And I think, yeah, let's see if this is now. Maybe. <laughs> Six. Um, so basically, you, this is how you connect to the MIDI device. It's not that super interesting, but you, this is a MIDI device. You connect to you connect to it by very few lines of JavaScript, and then you get uh, basically MIDI data out. And let's see. I will do a quick uh, demo, hopefully, if something works. Yeah. Um, So this already connected. That's why I have daughter, four years old, play the flute. But if you don't like that, then you can utilize some of this web audio that I mentioned before to say blah. Hopefully. No, it doesn't work because I connected the HDMI. There's probably some sound input. Use this icon, this would be like a uh, portrait node, this would be like no Chrome, 
around there, like those adverse part. And that's now like turned into together with some code service work that you can come progressive web apps. And this is what Microsoft's implementing in Windows now. And it's going to have like a major impact with like this is just because me and a few others really pushed for this idea. And then all the run one. So this problem. There's the thing with the gamepad API, it's a polling based, so it's not good for a reliable uh, data flow because you will get lost messing. The reasons the reason why it's polling based in the beginning of why it's polling based is because you don't want uh, you don't want your browser flooded with all the data coming from uh, from uh, for example analog uh, joysticks uh, between the uh, points in the game where you want to read. Let's see, I think I have something else that actually works there. Yeah. Just tell me if you don't want to use. I'll just, uh, Yeah, there's a bit of latency on the on the Chromecast up there. That's why I'm looking at that one, or I will just hit the wall. But I mean, it, uh, it sort of works. Die. So that's why the sound came a little bit dirty. But um, that's another thing you can do, and uh, I have source code for everything on on GitHub. So if you're interested in looking into that, just give me a hint. Let's see what do we have here. Uh, we'll just keep it there. Okay. So, uh, here's some status for how to connect the gamepad, but enough code for now. You can uh, see that later. I include some links, and of course, the slides will be sent out so you can dig into how to get things running and, and stuff uh, later. Uh, also, uh, just a few guys, <laughs> just kidding, myself, and uh, the guy with, uh, who did work with me here. There's a lot of information coming out uh, on a running basis, so if you're into those sort of things, uh, follow us and uh, so a few others. Okay. Does anyone want a break? Or do you want to hear about Web Bluetooth? Let's go. What? Let's go. Go on. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, uh, let's talk a bit about Bluetooth. Uh, some of you probably know this, but uh, there used to be uh, there used to be Bluetooth, and then uh, and then Narcad did uh, an implementation at the beginning of this uh, million. Uh, what was it called? I, can't I don't remember. But it was uh, for for low low power devices, of course, Narcad, mobile phones, and all this, and earphones. Uh, no, not earphones. <laughs> um, but uh, low low communication, low power communication, and uh, eventually, blah blah blah, became Bluetooth. Uh, Low energy Bluetooth, part of Bluetooth 4, now it's called Bluetooth Smart. And the devices that can speak both old school Bluetooth and new Bluetooth are called Smart Ready. Except for Bluetooth 5, which will be just Bluetooth 5, maybe. Not sure. I don't know. <laughs> so, I think they got inspired by Angular in their versioning. <laughs> Like, yeah, let's not call it that anymore, let's call it something else. I would say like Smart Ready was less good than Smart, but apparently yeah. that was uh, and Ready to be Smart. They're looking at the USB consortium and seeing they can fuck up names, so let's do it. Let's do the same. Anyhow, the thing is that many people think both security-wise, you, you remember all these stories about how you can hack the PCs with uh, Bluetooth drivers and all this. Uh, Bluetooth or energy, Bluetooth or is not the same as traditional Bluetooth. First of all, we should. They only Bluetooth. share the name. What? They only share the name. They share the name. An organization. It's just as smart. It's just as smart. Yes. <laughs> uh, there's a few uh, really cool features with uh, Bluetooth or energy, uh, or Bluetooth smart, is that um, advertising packets uh, is uh, sent out every now and then, uh, actually on a pretty stable basis. Uh, and they can uh, contain a lot of information, so you can have these, you probably heard of beacons, eye beacon, headstone beacon and other. They can contain so much information that you can, uh, that you don't have to connect to the units to get data out of it. Like valuable data, like temperature, humidity, whatever. Actually, they don't, they cannot contain a lot of info. The new ones, five, Bluetooth 5, they can. Bluetooth 5, they can like... Yeah. They can get yeah, excessive like, packages and then they can... That, that is, that's true, but, yeah. but you can have some data and you can have an extended, pa extended uh, packet that contains a little bit more data. What is it? 
I think it's uh, below 100 bytes uh, totally for the two, but it's enough to, I mean, temperature data, one byte, right? So, uh, or two, maybe if you want to be uh, picky. Um, so, that's pretty cool. Uh, pairing is optional, so it allows for you to do uh, things in the public space, uh, for example, what people can connect to, uh, connect to and interact with without pairing with it first, which uh, was a pain before, as you probably remember. Uh, connections are exclusive, so when you grab a device, uh, it's uh, hidden, it's gone for everyone else until it release again. Uh, but it's also very low latency, so I think it was around 100 milliseconds promised on old, uh, old Bluetooth uh, devices, and uh, due to low energy, it's a, a single digit uh, 6 milliseconds or something. So you could actually do something where you borrow the device and give it up to someone else, but I don't remember any use case where that makes sense. So you could do it. Uh, there's another, another thing, this uh, uh, gap identifiers, I'll get to that, it allows you to, uh, uh, it's just sort of standard, a little bit like the human uh, device, uh, human interaction device uh, for keyboards from USB and, and similar for different classifications. Uh, these um, generic attribute uh, profiles allows you to, for example, have a heart rate monitor or other things that follow a specific uh, well defined as it so you can do let's see here you can do stuff like this this is the this is profile where you have different so you have sorry you have different services on the Bluetooth energy device they can have uh, they have different characteristics that's basically values that you can read and write or no, be notified on and then uh, you can have multiple services and they can be nested. So one example here is the heart rate service which uh, has a mandatory heart rate measurement uh, notification characteristic. It has an optional body sensor location, so uh, I guess it's, you can have it on your arm or chest or whatever. I think finger, arm, chest, there's uh, like 10 different things uh, that you can read. And then there's a conditional one depending on uh, how the um, uh, form of the sensor is. But anyway, the, the, this is standardized. So if you do a heart rate sensor that follows the spec, any third party developer who has nothing to do with you, who's done a heart rate uh, monitor app, can interact with your device, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, so all of a sudden you can mix and match uh, from different vendors. Uh, the OS support, uh, yeah, <laughs> again, Windows. Windows only recently added uh, to Windows 10. But it's pretty cool. No, we're talking about Chrome. Sorry? We're talking about Chrome. No. No. Bluetooth or energy. Oh. Basic support. Windows only recently added it. There has been some drivers before where you have custom drivers, but, it, but uh, proper system support that was uh, recently added. Linux has had it uh, <laughs> sort of uh, through many years growing steadily to, uh, to the point of, I think it was, yeah, Blues 5.42, which came late 2016 finally uh, had this uh, GET DBoss API out of experimenting so without any hacks on the system you could actually use your user learning the uh, devices as intended. OS was uh, 10 around 2011 along with the devices uh, and Android since uh, 4.3. So, so this, there's pretty wide support now. And uh, about that uh, Windows thing uh, I think the guy who developed uh, the Bluetooth Energy part of Windows, he also did the uh, original one because immediately, initially, uh, until the creators update, I think it was around that, it still required pairing, meaning that all the cool features that you could get out of it, that it didn't get support also. So, but now it's coming, and uh, so, so. Uh, yeah, so, so the, the get support said with the crypt, you should all update to create a something if you're using those. Uh, is there? The Chrome integration, I guess, will come at some point uh, for web Bluetooth. Uh, but there's this uh, cool guy, interesting guy, Uri. Uh, he made a polyfill, uh, which you can use now in, um, in, uh, in Chrome. So you can get, as, as what was the case, it says, which more features today on Windows. Yeah, because on Linux it works. Right? So, um, Let's see here. The basics, as a bit of code again, uh, but uh, it is again basically this, the, the, the promise chain here where you request the device, having a battery service, getting the battery service, yeah, sorry, you can't read it down there. Uh, 
uh, get the battery service, uh, get the characteristics, uh, read the value, and the battery, then right, the battery percentage is this. And then in case of the heart rate one is up over here, you find a device that has a heart rate uh, service on it, and then you connect. You get the heart rate service from that device that you connect to, you get the heart rate measurement characteristic, which had the notification part so you can get notified. Then you start notifications on that, and then every time you get a new heart rate value, prints out uh, whatever the heart rate is. So it's as simple as this to do a uh, web app that uh, integrates with Bluetooth uh, or anything. Of course, um, uh, it has to be uh, uh, running on HTTPS, and for security reasons, I think it's still there, it can only be initiated by a user gesture. So it's not like you go to a web page and all of a sudden it knows all your beautiful stuff. Uh, you have to click something to get it in, uh, initiated. And there will be a dialogue. And there will be a dialogue, like the one, but uh, we'll see it then. Um, yeah, actually, uh, this is also a good Nordic. Uh, <coughs> they have been kind enough to uh, sponsor something for our common raffle here. Two of these thingies. Let me just switch up my phone. It's a black box. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> cool, uh, but, uh, but it has a shitload of sensors and it's really cool. It's, it's, uh, it's based around uh, the Nordic new series, so it's a uh, Dusel 5. Uh, it's uh, the mid-range product, I think. They have three different ones. And uh, so it's uh, it's uh, pretty powerful as well. And uh, you could probably, I think you can reprogram it by uh, attaching some uh, some stuff to the headers here, or you can just use it as is, because it has a lot of sensors and microphone and whatnot uh, that, uh, that works uh, pretty well. And let's see here. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, well, now we hope it works. I promised all kinds of things. Uh, so it's a small black box here, and you, you open it. Ah, this. And then you take a look and find the power button here. Then you should start blinking blue, saying that you can connect to it. Then you go to thing E. They made a web components website. So again, this is a web page. And let's hope for the best. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> no, of course it works. Uh, the thing is here, it's now connected, and this is a web page, right? So, let's see. We can see motion, and here we can see, I think it's going to try to load some Yeah, I see 3D measurements and whatnot, and temperature and all kinds of things. And this is all web. Uh, I think there's also some really, really cool sounds. Nice. Okay, maybe this is um, And you could do it if this, then that, then conversion. Where all this is, this is Polymer app, and uh, there's also an Android and iOS app for it. And uh, they have, uh, I think they have uh, the spec for the, the the hardware design. Everything is uh, open hardware, open software, open source software. And in the website, in yeah, the website size of GitHub. So as long as you buy the chips, they're happy. Exactly. <laughs> That's what they say. They give everything else for free, man. <laughs> Uh, but I think that's pretty cool. Well, no, what? Oh, the temperature. Oh, Where's the, the temperature? temperature so you should get like the, the toxins. Yeah. Parts per million. Alcohol. It's a zero. It's a zero. It could be that it's not uh, enabled on uh, this one. It works on my phone. Temperature pressure. Yeah, oh, 400 now. <laughs> oh, okay. Fair enough. You can even detect color. Mm -hmm. and you, oh yeah, this is the most important part. You can set colors, and my kids think so at least. I think you can set the color. Mode. Mm -hmm. so you have to say constant, and then you can say red, pink, blue, or whatever. It's very nice. And the button. Oh, there's a button on it. Oh, it's... So, okay, you can do all kinds of cool things with this device. And, uh, you can do this okay, and uh, there are two upper apples. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so there's a small limit with regards to the microphone, I guess. Or how, how is 
it can be also transfer. Uh, yeah, I think in the NFC market, uh, there's. I think they didn't hook up everything to the web app yet. It was just. I think that's what it was. Experiment, I guess, from one of the guys. They have uh, an Android phone. Uh, should, should, should that be possible with that web app? Yeah, yeah, I think you can. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the thing with Bluetooth 5 also, I mean, of course, you can stream, it. You can stream up to 2 uh, megabit, isn't it? Which is pretty cool. Because no energy wouldn't necessarily be able to. Uh, the, uh, well, it's, it's not that low, it's, but it kind of depends like what quality you send and stuff like that. Which is the, the big way is too, I guess. Yeah, it's quiet. 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 You cannot test the thing. <laughs> uh, you can also buy these online, I think it's like 300 bucks. 300 kroners, right? 40 uh, euro. 40 euro. Yeah. But it, it, oh, 40 dollars. Okay. But uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, it seems to work uh, also today. Which is awesome. Um, let me see what else do I have in stock. There's some links. Of course, you're going to get the. Uh, Sorry, uh, thank Nordic for the reference. Sorry? Excuse me, talk to Nordic. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Oli. Uh, and uh, I think I think what they did was pretty awesome. Uh, well, last got Nordic to sponsor some of these for Yeah. Uh, and uh, actually, we should also mention that the part of the raffle is uh, the device I showed you before from uh, Freescale now NXP uh, is no uh, call. No call. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, uh, is uh, this small board here, which has uh, some sensors on it and uh, RGB uh, diode, very easy to program, so do your own stuff. Um, Arrow, uh, one of the uh, larger distributors in Denmark, they sponsored <coughs> for the raffle. These two, whoops, four. There's two different ones. There's one that's called uh, KL46 set, and that has uh, some uh, display and uh, it has uh, a magnetometer and a few other sensors, and they're all Arduino-ish compatible in the, in the late connections. And the other one is uh, the 25 set that the same one uses here. So, uh, put your name on board out there. However, in order to be able to win some of the hardware here, please go to this link and uh, answer a few questions. Not tricky at all, but it's very helpful for us uh, if uh, you know which direction you're going with your stuff. So uh, have a break, but go to the link, and we will check if someone wins the raffle here, and they did not uh, pick <laughs> no. Thanks a lot. Break now.